I am very happy to introduce today's speaker, Frederick Holmes, who graduated from the School of Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle in 1957. First came to the University of Kansas Medical Center as an intern that same year, uh, and essentially never left. Uh, has been there since. Uh, very interestingly, he has uh, pursued studies in mission theology, <coughs> tropical medicine, and Chinese language, and was a medical missionary in Malaya. Uh, it says he retired in 2000, but I think it's safe to say he's as busy as ever. Uh, with a master's degree in British history from the University of Kansas and with his joint appointment as, as professor of the history and philosophy of medicine at the medical center, he is well positioned to focus on history and medical humanities. Besides over 100 scientific publications and two books on cancer, he has published on medical problems in Tudor and Stuart, England and is pursuing research in 17th century English medicine. It was my pleasure to hear uh, Dr. Holmes give a version of this lecture last year at the annual AHM uh, meeting uh, at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. And I was looking at the program uh, in my office yesterday, and I noticed that I had marked in the margin a big star that says, well done. And when I do that on a conference program, uh, an invitation to come to Birmingham, is sure to follow. And I'm happy to say he, he accepted. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Frederick Holmes, who will tell us about influenza in an American military hospital in France in 1918. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. I'm honored to be in the Lister Hill Library. I actually know who Senator Hill was. <laughs> very much in his debt for the Hill Burton Act that changed American hospitals after the Second World War in ways that most of you young people can never understand and were quite wonderful. I have a very fine uh, feeling about Birmingham because in the 1960s I came here to take the oral part of my medicine board and passed. So I owe a lot more to Birmingham than you could imagine. My talk today about influenza in 1918 has to have an introduction about how I came on this day that was pure serendipity, pure blind luck. I must recognize my two collaborators, Grace Holm, my wife, a pediatrician, who has always kept me honest and helped me more than I can say, and Pete Cuppage, a pathologist, who helped us look through the autopsy data, because I'm going to present autopsy data to you from this hospital in 1918. Now, for those of you who are younger, this is patronizing, but forgive me. I'm talking about the First World War, the one in 1918, not the Second World War, not the big one, in 1941 to 1945. I have enough of a historian in me now to put up an argument uh, to work against. So here's my argument. Military medicine of the First World War was of the technology of the 20th century. Treatment of influenza patients in the 1918 pandemic by base hospital number 28, the hospital of what I will tell you about, reflects this clearly. In Kansas City, Missouri, there is a monument, this is a 1936 picture of this monument, the tall pile, and you can see on the left an outbuilding, and on the far right you can see another building rather like it. This is a memorial to the veterans of the First World War. It's probably the largest, most extensive such monument in the United States. In In the late 1990s, the city decided to raise a fair amount of money and enlarge this monument. So what you see here in white uh, is tunneling down into the limestone beneath the monuments in this area here, three stories to build one of the most remarkable war museums I've ever seen in the world. I've been traveling the world over for many years. It's, it's an excellent depiction of what the war was like, that it really was a world war in 1918. Four and a half years ago, just months after it reopened, my wife and I went down there one day just out of curiosity and said, you got any medical stuff down there, down here? They said, yeah, we got boxes of it. It's been stored away in caves for over for 90 years. No one's ever looked at it. And what we found was 
the records of Base Hospital 28, which went from Kansas City to France in 1918, a 2,500-bed military hospital. And I'm going to show you some of the records. And from that, we could reconstruct how this hospital took care of 1,295 patients with influenza. Now, just to recall for you the status of the war, here is Belgium, Germany, France, Switzerland down here, and here we have the front as far as it got with the German invasion of France. Here's Paris down here. At the end of the war, uh, the Americans joined the war, and we had troops fighting in France by June of 1918. And it was the Marines at, at, at Belleau Wood down here who, to be crude, but make it clear, kicked the crap out of the Germans for the first time anybody who really took them to task. And the Germans gave the Marines, our United States Marines, the title of Teufel Wunder, Devil Dogs, which they carry to this day. And after America entered the war, we had two million troops finally in France. The war ended in, on the 11th of November, 1918. Here's another look at the, at the front, and here was the front in about September, and then the Americans, with the Americans help, the front was pushed right up to the Belgian border. And at this point, the Germans exhausted, gave in, and the armistice was signed. The war did not really start for America until April of 1917, though it started for Europe in the, in, in the fall of 1914. In when the Germans started sinking American ships in, in March of 1917, President Wilson, who was against fighting in Europe, finally declared war on Germany. A number of American cities, including Birmingham, which can be now, put together hospitals that would became American military hospitals. The one we had in Kansas City was number 28. The one I think we had here, which didn't go to France, it went to, I think, to, to Italy, was hospital number 102. These are the two doctors in Kansas City who created this hospital. By strange circumstance, they were both born in Scotland, neither knew the other. John Binney was professor of surgery at our medical school of Kansas, and Lindsay Mill, professor of medicine. He qualified with an FRCS, and he with an MRCP. Binney was over 50 at the time this hospital was created in Kansas City by recruiting local doctors and nurses and was an internationally known surgeon. His, his textbook of operative surgery was known the world over. Uh, Milne was uh, multilingual, uh, had done research for the Rockefeller Foundation and others, and had traveled widely. They were quite remarkable guys, and because they knew what was happening in Europe, they were the ones who galvanized Kansas City doctors beginning in August of 1917 to create this hospital. They spent months recruiting doctors and recruiting nurses, finally were inducted into the military beginning in December of 1917, and then moved to Georgia to train, and finally in July in 1918, boarded the SS Megantic and were taken en masse with other military personnel to France. This is a very poor photo, and I'm very sorry about that, but when you cruise around the internet looking for, for <laughs> images, uh, you get strange things, but I thought this is, the one stacker was not a very large ship, even for its time, and that's the ship that got them to, to Europe. I want to pay a special tribute to nurses, because there's no question but that it was good nursing or excellent nursing in American military hospitals that made the good survival rates what they were. And if any physician knows, those of you who are physicians, your first uh, debt to, to your success is the nurses who care for your patients. This is a picture from the Kansas City newspaper at the time, and here are five of the women who went as Red Cross nurses, all unmarried, you can see, uh, lovely, nice young women, and they were Red Cross nurses. Almost all the nurses who went to France for America were sent by the Red Cross. Only a few were sent by the Army. And let me tell you, the image of the Red Cross nurse in America at that time in song and everything else was of an angel. 
There were many stories about the Red Cross nurse, posters and uh, songs, popular songs written about these angels. The hospital was placed in the Mauges in France, about 200 miles from the front. There were 100 U.S. base hospitals placed anywhere from 50 to 300 miles from the front. And these were the large hospitals that collected the patients who had been triaged and sent by rail to a general hospital where they could have their problems sorted out and solved. And they were moved by trains. Now the chain of uh, triage and whatnot went like this. You went from the trenches or the battle to a first aid casualty clearing station. If you could be patched up and your injuries were minor, you were sent back to your unit. If not, you were then taken to a field hospital. The field hospital was basically like the MASH unit that we see on television with Alan Walda and those rascals. Uh, this rerunning, been a rerun for the next 5,000 years, I suppose. <laughs> those men who could not survive, who had a, a belly wound with bowel leaking fecal contents into the abdomen, an open chest wound, an open head wound, were given morphine and allowed to die. Those who could survive but needed more definitive surgery were then sent to an evacuation hospital and eventually taken in these special ambulance trains. Uh, here you can see bunks three high on either side. Uh, there are about 50 or 60 men per car. And the railroads in France were so good that they could be moved back to the base hospitals in four, six, eight hours. And then here is a, an ambulance train that has arrived at Hospital uh, 27 at Angers. Uh, and you can see how the cars are organized. They had nurses. Some of the trains had operating suites in the cars. So the, the, the patients were stable when they were put in, this, in these ambulance trains. But even if they had acute problems that needed to be managed, they had as good management as you could have for the time. I want to just acquaint you a little bit before I talk about influenza about the, the view of the hospital. Most of the hospitals that were built in France for the American military were slapped up in, in June and July. One story buildings built with wood and a, an individual unit which might hold uh, 40, 50 men could be put up in a day or two. And so there were rows of these buildings. Now this just happens. In this material that we found in the World War I Museum in Kansas City, I'm going to share a lot of this stuff with you, there are thousands upon thousands of images, including things like this. Uh, Dr. Skinner was uh, a radiologist, uh, and he, he sent Christmas greetings at home with a picture of his hospital from the Lowe's Christmas 1918. Um, this is what the inside of a ward looked like. And here we have ward two in base hospital 28 and you can see now some of these guys probably just came to get their picture but you can see the cots close together uh, an aisle down the center and you can see a nurse you can see two nurses back there identifiable in those days with a proper white cap and believe me the men worship the nurses i'm a i've been singing barbershop quartet music for 40 years and i there are several songs of that era. One is, I don't want to get well, I don't want to go home, I fell in love with my nurse. <laughs> <laughs> there, were some, there are some cartoons in our collection stuff, and here's a cartoon by a soldier. Here's Ward 13 of Base Hospital 28. Here's the orderly bringing bedpans and urinals to these guys who are obviously confined uh, to their uh, beds at bed rest. Now this hospital, was, as I told you, mostly single-story wooden buildings. But next door was a large girls' school, the uh, Bel Air Seminary, which had been, the, the construction had just been completed. And this was given to the hospital as well. So altogether, with the one-story wooden buildings, with the Bel Air Seminary, and with some tents for those who were pretty well and ready to either go back to their unit or to be evacuated back to the States. There were 2,500 deaths. Now to show you how good these doctors were and nurses, 
they could accommodate by these trains, a train would disgorge five to 600 patients all at once. They would be triaged on the spot, being taken from the train. The biggest day for this particular hospital was 1,100 admissions. Can you imagine admitting 1,100 people to your hospital here? You couldn't do it to my hospital, I'll tell you that for sure. The facilities, considering everything was slapped together quickly, were quite good. So here's an OR. Most of the ORs had, like MASH, had several tables so that the surgeons could go from one to the next, going into the frame. But just to show you, uh, this doesn't look all that much different from a modern operating theater, and we're talking now about 1918. The gases that could be used in anesthesia at that time were only nitrous oxide, but there is oxygen thanks here as well. One of my colleagues who's an anesthesiologist has also taken this data and is beginning now to write and present the incredible change in anesthesiology with this war. Because for the first time, proper anesthesia could be given, shock could be controlled, and patients' the mortality from the anesthetic was almost nothing in this hospital. Uh, the anesthesia was largely nitrous oxide, ether, chloroform, or regional anesthesia was then possible with a compound called sorbitol, rather like uh, the canes that we use now. Now, the x-ray was invented in 1895 by Rankin, as you know. By 1918, 23 years later, x-rays were used the world around, and the quality of films was really pretty good. I put this up with sort of tongue-in-cheek. There were several kinds of imaging, including a excellent, excellent for the time, excellent x-ray images. And here you can see a patient with a right pneumothorax. You can see the flaps one, and here is the uh, air in the portal space. You can also, there's probably some shift for me to sign it as well. You see the heart out to the left. Now, the patients, when they were triaged, if there was some finding that was obvious, they were, uh, either notations were made on their bodies or drawings were made on their bodies. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You, you are your own medical record. <laughs> so here, you can see a young man uh, with a cardiac silhouette that's uh, pretty, pretty broad for his age. My guess would be he's, he's got rheumatic heart disease, which is very common at the time. Not unlike to get mitral stenosis. The records were very simple. We do not have many of the records. They were on cards. Here are the records of two patients. <coughs> um, so uh, you can see this patient was admitted on the 20th of September uh, with rusty sputum. Uh, anybody know what rusty sputum means? Nobody knows anymore. It's virtually diagnostic of the pneumococcalonia. And the, he probably didn't even have a chest x-ray because it wasn't needed. Uh, here are the findings, uh, the rawls that were heard, written on, uh, noted on his back. So he had, from behind, he had probably a left uh, uh, lower lobe pneumonia. And there were some rawls heard, ultimately, the next, uh, two days later on the right, rawls less on the left. You can see that the treatment here was ticture digitalis teacher of digitalis. Um, you have to remember, from what I tell you for the rest of the talk, there were no antibiotics. The first actual antibacterial didn't come along until the 1930s was with self -nomine. It was not known that a virus causes disease. But, as I will show you subsequently, these docs were capable of making a distinction between pneumococcal pneumonia and influenza. Acute influenza. They could make the, the diagnosis and distinguish virtually all of these patients, sort them out, uh, when they took them off the train. Now, the reason they gave digitalis at this time was that there, it was possible to have heart failure with pneumonia, and there really wasn't much else you could do with pneumococcal pneumonia. The mortality rate for acute bacteria in the morning at this time was 25%, no matter how healthy you were. You, were, you had a 25% chance of dying and a 75% chance of getting better and having no residual. And digitalis was thought to improve survival. Now here is a record of a man admitted 
in the, on the 22nd of October with influenza, much improved, evacuated, uh, it says on the 22nd, somebody got there, but actually apparently was uh, uneventful recovery and fit for duty, lungs, uh, throat normal, Lieutenant Conklin, uh, First Lieutenant, uh, Medical Corps, discharges him on the 13th, two days after the armistice, so he doesn't have to go back to the trenches, and uh, he's, he's cured, that's the word. Now, interestingly enough, in this hospital, and I suspect it was true of all these big case hospitals, all 100 of them, uh, there were more people with illness than there were with surgical injuries. And all of the injuries that I'll show you were, were classified as GS double gunshot wounds. But a substantial proportion of the injuries really were from artillery rounds because there was constant in the trenches artillery rounds going back and forth between the Germans and the Americans, the French, or the English. And you can see these are open wounds and treated. Now, interestingly enough, the photos we have, you couldn't do this with HIPAA anymore, but they all have identity on them. And of course, all these people are dead. Martin Schoep here had a gunshot wound, the hip and the thigh. And we have a, quite a number of photos, and I'll show you some of them, to show uh, the injuries that they, they, the, the, the battle wounds and how they were treated, how they were cared for. Here's a man with a facial injury, uh, Neil Shan, a gunshot wound to the face. Uh, and you can see uh, he's got a drain in there. And in, in the First World War, Plastic surgery was born. This was the first war where there was any possibility <coughs> of repairing facial wounds. So plastic surgery was born in the First World War. Here is a hand wound, Cecil Smith, gunshot wound to the left hand. You can see exposed tendons. You can see there are drains in there. And they were obviously uh, going to skin graft him. Draft, you know. Skin grafting was primitive at that time, but it was possible. Uh, there are autopsy pictures in, in our collection. Um, here is a uh, cadaver. Uh, influenza, uh, uh, myositis of the left knee. Here is a um, gas in, in, in infestation. This man has a wound in his knee and he has he died of gas gangrene. So infection with uh, Clostridium perfringens or one of its close relatives. <coughs> we have a number of photos like this. Now one of the remarkable things that came out of all of these data that we found in this museum in Kansas City is a complete list of all the patients. Somebody sat down, the war ended now on the, 8th, on the 11th of November, 1918. And the hospital did not close until the end of January, 1919. So somebody in February, or, and did not come back to, a, the men did not come back to America, the docs and the nurses, until May of 1919. So somebody sat down in February, March, or April, and made a complete alpha list of all the patients. And there are over 9,000 names on these lists. So in the space of well, about six months, this hospital was functioning. They admitted up between nine and 10,000 patients. And we are just now finishing digitizing this. You can see a name, a, a, a rank, the unit, the serial number, the date of admission, and the diagnosis. And we're gonna, obviously, uh, we can sort this, it's on a spreadsheet. We're just now auditing it to be sure the diagnoses are right. And we'll be able to sort all these diagnoses out. Diagnoses out. And we'll be able to have a clear picture of what one hospital did in 1918, which will be invaluable, I think, for, for he or she who wants to look at the uh, distribution of cases at this time in this war. Now we need to talk a little bit about influenza. The influenza pandemic that swept the world in 1918 has been called the Spanish influenza. Well, the Spaniards didn't name it, obviously. And the sad truth is, in all likelihood, the first cases were in January 1918 in Haskell County in western Kansas. 
Pasco County is west of Dodge City, Kansas, which is about as far west as you can get. And a, a country doctor out there, I, I'm sorry, I should have looked up his name for you, I forgot his name, described the first cases of an influenza-like illness that had a high mortality rate and spread quickly through this farming community. Got the attention of the state uh, epidemiologist, health officer, and, and the national health officers. And then, amazingly enough, the cases appeared at Fort Riley in Kansas. Fort Riley is still there. It's an important cavalry post in, in, in the American military. And at that time, it was where recruits were collected and induct, after induction into the Army and trained. They got their basic training there. So here we have in Western Kansas a new kind of influenza, new to the world, an H1N1 influenza that goes with a few recruits to Fort Riley and spreads instantly among thousands of recruits. And here is a classic picture. You see this in any, any, any story of influenza in America in 1918. Here are the cots in a temporary, in a, in a building, laid one on one. The mortality rate was relatively high, and it quickly spread so that by a, a week later, it was in Queens in New York, it was in Brest, France in August, in West Africa in August, and as far as the Spaniards are concerned, they didn't get the disease until November. But they have borne the brunt of the guilt of this disease, and it's it's not their fault at all. It's the fault of Kansas, from whence I come, for which I, of course, am ashamed. <laughs> now, understanding the cause of influenza in 1918. A bacterial cause was presumed by many, and the Pfeiffer bacillus, presently known as Haemophilus influenzae, was the leading candidate. Viral illness was known, but influenza was not thought to be a viral illness. And you'll see why that was, was understood at the time. The viral cause of influenza was not determined until 1931 when Richard Schulte, an American virologist, isolated what we now know as the influenza virus, first in swine and then in 1933 in humans. So everything that was done for the treatment of these patients, plus the bacteriology and everything else, was done on the presumption that it was a, a disease caused by bacteria. Now, in this hospital, as we have put it together from the materials that we have, management was bed rest in an infectious disease ward, standard laboratory procedures, which included CBCs, urine examinations, and a limited number of blood chemistries that possible at the time, quite sophisticated bacteriology. You'll be quite surprised at how good the bacteriology was at the time, x-ray and fluoroscopic facilities, and excellent nursing care. We cannot uh, stress more strongly how important and how good the nursing care was. The nurses owned the wards, owned the patients, and were committed uh, to their care. Here is one of the bacteriology labs in this hospital, Base Hospital 28. It looks a bit shabby, but remember, there was no fluorescent lighting at that time, and this was a temporary building. They could, they could, here's the incubator, they could do cultures of most anything and they could speciate uh, quite distinctly among all the common pathogens. Now here, though it's not involved in this, is the anaerobic incubator. As I told you and I showed you the one autopsy case, gas gangrene was a common problem in these injuries because uh, they were dirty wounds uh, and most of the, the, sh the artillery shells landed not on the patients, but landed in the earth near the patients, sent fragments, shrapnel into the patients with dirt. So a lot of gas gangrene was seen. And this, uh, we, we spent some time, my wife did actually, spent some time trying to figure out how they got this makeshift uh, incubator for anaerobes constructed. It's in fact a 10 gallon gasoline can of the time. And with a complicated, or actually um, relatively simple uh, uh, mechanism of displacing air, they could make an anaerobic uh, 
uh, incubator. And isolate Bosporidium fringens and some of the other anaerobes from wounds. And just as an aside, uh, my wife, as I told you, the pediatrician, became interested in this. And she found the records of an English woman surgeon who was at the Scottish Women's Hospital near Paris, who became, for, for the time, this was a hospital uh, run by, a 500 bed hospital, run by a charity of Scottish women. And this, this woman surgeon created a mechanism of anticipating gas gangrene. And she reported a series of 107 patients with good gas gangrene culture proof, and she saved 75% of them. Save 75%. Quite astonishing. Now, here's uh, one of the x rays uh, of the influenza patients, and obviously, influenza doesn't do this, and this obviously is just a bit of the emulsion from the film, it's, it's silver emulsion. So, here is left lung, here's the cardiac silhouette, here's the right lung and the right hilum, uh, and you can see this is a left lower lobe pneumonia. With this, with the uh, bronchial uh, shadow. Okay, one of the important things to sort out these data <coughs> is to decide on the basis of the admissions where pneumonia was common throughout the year, but influenza was common only as an was, was only an epidemic disease. So here are admissions with with pneumonia most often pneumococcal pneumonia stacked against admissions with influenza. And you can see the bulge of the, of the, um, the first patients. The hospital was not operative until the end of July, so even in August, in full operation, there were only six, 16 cases of influenza. 280 in September, 578 in October. So the, the, the uh, <coughs> epidemic swept through France with October being the heaviest month, and then declined as the uh, non-immune non pool diminished. And by December, it was on the wane, and into the new year, I don't have the figures up here, uh, there were relatively few more cases. Now, I, I give you this slide, still wondering how it can be true, but I've spent a lot of time trying to substantiate these data, and this is what we found. Of the 1,295 patients admitted to base hospital 28 with a diagnosis of influenza, there were 24 deaths. That's all. That is a death rate of just 2%. Of the 24 deaths, 22 were autopsy. I've made every effort. I've written to the National Archives. I've looked at some records from other hospitals, other base hospitals, and 2% seems to be about right. Seems to be common. Now, in 2009, in this country, for uh, with the H1 influenza, once again, the, the hospital death rate was at least two percent. Rich, do you know how much it was? It was it's about two percent. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Without an intensive care unit, <coughs> without oxygen therapy, without any antibiotics, they achieved what we achieved uh, 91 years later. And we're, we were, were quite surprised to find the autopsy reports. So the autopsy reports were all gross. There was no microscopic material that we could find. But the gross autopsies were quite interesting. In period of distribution of autopsy deaths, none in July or August, one in September, 12 in October, uh, five in November, uh, four in December. The number of physicians in this hospital varied, but the total number was probably around 50 to 60. And these were the cream of young doctors from Kansas City and its environments. And I, I won't bore you with who they became or what they were, but they became the leaders in Kansas City medicine. Some of them became national leaders. A Skinner, whose Christmas card I showed you, was a national leader in radiology, rather like uh, Dr. Edmund. Huh? Who, who's a radiologist? Dr. Reynolds. Reynolds, Dr. Reynolds. I suspect he was a, a colleague of Dr. Reynolds. Uh, the first uh, neurosurgeon in Kansas City was in this group of physicians. So 
there was there were at least two pathologists available. So autopsies were readily available and easily done. We got a lot of data on the surgical uh, cases that I won't show you here that uh, showed that they had excellent uh, they had excellent ophthalmology, ENT, and uh, probably not urologists. As best we could tell, there were no urologists there, but urologic injuries were at that time were taken care of by general surgeons. Here's the age distribution of the autopsy and influenza deaths. Uh, 15 to 19, 3, uh, 20 to 24, 5, 25 to 29, 11, and 30 to 34, 3. Roughly, you can see that's the uh, distribution of the American military in France. Now, in 1918, the population of America was about 130 million, and we put 2 million soldiers in France in 1918. That's an astonishing achievement. It took a year to get them there. And this is their men, largely late teens and early and 20s. And there was, of course, a draft. Uh, most of these men were not recruits, uh, they were drafted. Here are the initial white blood cell counts in these autopsy patients. Five to 10,000, eight, which you'd expect in influenza. 10 to 15,000, three. 15 to 20,000, four. And greater than 20,000, seven. Uh, one imagines that uh, those who had a white count this high were already infected with bacteria. The distribution of the hospital deaths from the time of admission. 12 died within the first week of hospitalization in this hospital, seven within the second week, none in the third week, two in the fourth week, and then finally one in the sixth week. So try to calculate how long it took to get somebody from the trench to the aid station, to the MASH sort of hospital, then to the evacuation hospital, and then to this hospital, and recognizing that some of the cases of influenza never got here because they died before they got here. I was telling Dr. Whitley last night at dinner that uh, my wife and I were interns uh, in the University Hospital in 1957 when the Asian flu was going through the world. And there were 20 interns in our class for 500 bed hospital, and one of our interns died. He was sick for one day and was dead. Perfectly healthy young man. Now, here are lung cultures at autopsy, and some cultures are multiple. You can see most for Streptococcus pneumoniae, 16. There was another Streptococcus, the Friedlander bacillus, Klebsiella pneumoniae 2, the Pfeiffer bacillus, that which was at that time the putative organism of thought to cause influenza, just three, Staphylococcus 4, other gram negative 7, and Micrococcus catarrhalis 2. So it takes if you think about this, that's pretty sophisticated bacteriology for almost 100 years ago. And it was well done and accurate, as best we can tell. The lung culture, if there was a single organism gotten, pneumococcus, you see, uh, prevailed at five, vipers, two, three blenders, one, and gram negative, one. Now, the principal autopsy diagnoses as cause of death, these were all patients who were identified as having influenza at the time of admission from the train. And I'm reasonably confident from reading this material that they, that they really could screen the influenzas and the bacterial pneumonias. So, lobar pneumonia was the cause in 10, bronchial pneumonia the cause in, in, in 10, other pneumonia one, meningitis one, and influenza. None, none, none were described as dying of influenza. All were described as dying of a bacterial cause. Now, the causes of death in influenza are these. Uncontrolled inflammatory response leading to rapid lung failure, which we would now call ARDS, which occurs in a very short period of time. I'm sticking my neck out, and Dr. Ridley's probably going to whack my head off, but he, he's not what he could be back there. But <clears throat> this was not seen, and my guess is that the patients who had this died 
and the hospital close to the front. They do not get to the base hospital. Viral compromise of lung function leading to pneumococcal pneumonia. Other bacterial pneumonias as secondary lung infections, and then finally a primary viral pneumonia, which apparently was at this point rare. Relatively rare. So, in patients with overwhelming pneumococcal infection largely died within the first week of hospitalization, whereas those with mixed bacterial cultures died later. I want to conclude, and then I have a postscript to, to give you. So my conclusion, recognizing my argument at the beginning, the management of patients with H1N1 influenza in an American military hospital in France in 1918 was very effective. The hospital death rate of 2% is comparable to that of the 2009 epidemic. Respect is due our medical forebears, far better physicians and surgeons than we presently imagine. We can learn from the past, and we should respect the present. And when we finish this initial analysis, and we're still not done, there's still more things to do with these data, we, we thought, how could this be? How could they have been so good? Now, as I told you, most of these guys, there were no women physicians in this group, became uh, the leading physicians in Kansas City in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even into the 1960s. Some of them I knew, and some of them indeed were excellent physicians. Here is a group picture of some of the Red Cross nurses who were attached to hospital one day. And this, I suspect, is an army nurse. And these, of course, are Red Cross nurses. There was a famous poem in the First World War, in Flanders fields of poppies blow between the crosses row on row. Uh, my wife has spent some time sorting out why the poppies grew and why there was uh, gas gangrene. And she gave a talk at a military history meeting not long ago and was very well received. That's yet another story. But I present the picture of the poppies because this is a symbol at the time of the carnage of the war. The contrast between the beauty of the poppies and the uh, ghastliness of the war. Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, a Canadian surgeon, in the Ypres salient in 1915, exhausted after 17 days operating on the wounded, wrote the poem I'm going to read to you, sitting on the back of an ambulance. Dr. McRae is famous for this poem. He's also famous as a surgeon. He sadly died of pneumonia complicated by meningitis in 1918. The bodies were buried adjacent to, to the hospitals on the front in temporary graveyards. And here is a temporary graveyard. And the soil was disturbed in these areas by, had been disturbed by artillery rounds. And also, uh, you don't see the poppies here, but the poppies started to grow first around these crosses, and that is what Colonel McCray saw. This poem, which I'll read to you, probably is the most famous poem about any war of all time. It galvanized the entire Western world when it was first published. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the lark still singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Lieutenant Colonel John McCray. Thank you very much for your attention.